Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, The Basics of Installation Audio presented by Jonathan Isaacs. My name is Mallory Misnarsik and I'm the project manager here at Harman. A few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during this webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit questions to the presenter and I'll try to answer as many as possible at the end. This webinar will also be recorded and a link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. We encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional Training to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to Jonathan, the presenter for today's webinar. After working as an audio video engineer for live events, Jonathan found himself drawn to the complexities of installation audio design and took a position at the Harman Agents for Africa. He has worked in over 10 countries designing and installing high-end audio and formed his own audio consultation company. And now I'll pass it over to you, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Mallory. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I changed microphones at the very last minute, but I believe we're all good. Um, let me start by saying, um, while I have done many audio training courses, usually I find myself training clients once we've put together a system for them. We, I'm often training clients on how to operate their own system. I, and I've also trained many technicians in my life. This is the first time I've ever done this virtually. When there's usually a camera or microphone involved, I'm usually far on the other end of it. So I am a little bit nervous. My first stress was that no one would actually attend, but we've got quite a lot of people there. I don't know if that makes me less or more nervous. So let's see how this goes. So I'm in coming to you from South Africa, my hometown of Johannesburg, more specifically my home in Stanton. I'm currently in my bar. Uh, I'm not going to be drinking, maybe afterwards. I should have started beforehand. Um, I wish I could all mix you a drink, but I'm Unfortunately, we can't send that virtually. So it's 7 p.m. here, so the sun's already gone down. Let me start with some house rules. I'm in my house. If you hear any weird noises in the background, it's either a hardy dog, which is a weird South African bird that sounds like it's screeching, or it's my newborn triplets, who also are weird screeching creatures. So basics of audio installation. So, Harman came to me with this as a subject, and it was a very, as you can imagine, a very vague subject. You know, audio installation and audio in general, it's nothing very specific. It's a very hard thing. And I, I thought about it for a while in what direction I want to go in. And I feel there's so many webinars, so many instructional videos, so many YouTube videos. I found thousands upon thousands of people talking about how to connect a speaker, how it plugs in, how to operate that mixer, how to do all this stuff. And yet, I don't believe that in the industry of audio installation that that is the biggest problem. I, over many, many years of doing this, have found that the biggest problem when it comes to installation audio is not how it was necessarily connected, not how it was mounted on the wall. More was it spec'd well for the client's needs. There's a term that goes around in the industry that I hear all too often that drives me. It, it, it used to be a funny term to me, and I'm sure anyone who's in audio have heard this term a million times. It usually starts with, oh, I had a call out. Uh, the system didn't work. It was an ID10T error. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of an ID10T error. Write it down and see what that spells. It's always, oh, there was nothing wrong with the sound system. The user messed up. The user did this. The client unplugged something. The client pressed the button they shouldn't have. The client pulled something. The client did this, did that. There was nothing wrong. The idiot client, the stupid client, the user this, the user that. And we, we often mock about that. But I actually, for many years ago, I realized that that's actually not a fair thing to say. You know, I don't understand tax. One bit. Taxes just don't get me. And I, I spend many hours on the phone with my accountant. And I'm sure when my accountant puts the phone down after talking to me, the first thing she says is, oh, God, not that idiot again. Or when I call, oh, this guy, he can't even add one plus one and times it by the current inflation. And I don't understand one bit. 
And something we have to think about with our clients, our, how do we expect our clients to order? It isn't their job. If our client is a restaurant owner, their job is to ensure that food tastes good, that your environment is nice, not that the sound system is plugged in correctly. And I started getting to the attitude of it's not the user error. It's the guy who installed it. It's the guy who spec the system. It's his error. He put in a system that the user simply can't operate, is incapable, or it's too complicated. I've come across so many installations where a client just needs a simple restaurant system to play background music. And there they are with this huge audio console. And yes, the client couldn't get it one day to work because it's complicated. So they press every button, they pulled every wire and they damage the system. I've come across, and it's not always the quality of the system. I've come across, I'm sure you've seen as we've walked into restaurants, anyone who's an audio tech would have walked into a restaurant or a bar or whatever and gone, oh, look at that rubbish on the wall. Look at that terrible sound system. What a crap brand. And then when the, and the audio that came out of it worked, as much as we want to mock it, at the end of the day, it did the soup. But on the other hand, we can have a beautiful top of the line JBL premium system and it doesn't work or it sounds absolutely terrible. It's not the equipment's fault, it's good equipment. Is it, we can say it's the user because the user maybe turned this knob too much or turned that knob too much. But is that really fair? If the user doesn't know what they're doing, if we can't blame them unless they're, if they're claiming to be an audio tech, then maybe. And that's the difference when we go to a live concert. When we go to a live concert or a live event and you've got an engineer, a sound engineer sitting behind a console and the sound is crap, then yeah, as we, you know, we'll often sit around and criticize them and tell them, oh man, that, that guy really doesn't have a clue. But when we go into an, a venue, uh, a restaurant, a bar, a conference room, whatever it may be, and the sound isn't good, we can't really blame the user. And that's something I, I want to try and get a, get through is, you know, how to, uh, how to, you know, help the client, how to make sure we're supplying the correct system for that client. Make sure it's a system that the client can actually operate. Make sure it's something that works works for the client, works for the venue. So this isn't going to be a technical talk necessarily. I want to go more into how to, it's going to be how to spec a system, how to understand the client's needs, how to do that. And the examples I'm going to use are very simple. So I hope it's not too simplified. I'm keeping this extremely, extremely simple because you know, I want to get people into it. So, and one last thing I wanted to mention is how I got into installation audio. I noticed that when we're doing events and when we're doing rentals, a big trend, you know, my bread and butter, how we used to make money in those days is we used to get contracts with um, contracts with hotels and every event that they had, we would be there supplying a little sound system. It would be usually very small stuff, very basic stuff, a little projector here, a little microphone there. And I noticed a massive, all of a sudden, downtrend. And what we noticed is that people were not renting stuff anymore. People were tending to buy. It's very uncommon. You would never go to a hotel conference room, rent a conference room, and go, where's, you know, you expect there to be a sound system. You expect there to be a projector. That's the norm. It's part of the building. There should be bricks in the wall, and there should be a projector on the roof. There should be speakers for me to play my laptop audio through a presentation. That is now considered the norm. Uh, a restaurant, if they, uh, if it's a, a restaurant, might have had a sound system, but if they're going to have a live event once a week or once a month, now they used to rent it in. Now they want to own it. They want to have it in, you know, in their thing. So I got very into the audio installation because of that, and I noticed how we would have this huge drop from a client because they would purchase their own equipment. We would drop all that. We wouldn't get any work from anymore. And a month or two later, all that work would come rushing back because they had bought a system that they couldn't operate. They couldn't get it to work. It stopped working. It no longer functioned. Someone broke it because they didn't know what they were doing. And I started wondering, what is the difference between system A that the client uses day in, day out, doesn't have a problem with system B that no one can ever get it to work? And it wasn't necessarily the brand. It wasn't necessarily the quality. It usually came down to how easy it was. Easy it was to operate. Um, was it part of the building? Because people, if it was ugly, if it wasn't the way, would usually get chopped up very quickly or covered up or blocked off, and that would cause many issues. So um, let's get started officially then.
And I'm not clicking. There we go. So I kind of cover through these why is audio installation become so important. And I really think it is because for many factors. People want their own equipment. People don't want to rent and they don't want to have the hassle of tape put all over their floor and having to call it in and it's becoming the norm. People expect that of a venue. They expect it of a restaurant to have something that sounds pleasant. If you go to the site to have your 40th birthday in a restaurant, it mustn't just be a system that can just play background music. If they're going to open themselves to events and rent uh, events and uh private bookings, you expect that you want to be able to maybe plug your phone in and have your own music. And it's becoming more, well, not more and more the norm, but I think it already is the norm that it is expected that people have that. So it's become so important that that system can work, can be multifunction. So like I said, while my presentation is small to medium, I am going to keep this, the examples I'm going to be using are extremely small. It's going to be a very small but I believe a lot of these concepts and ideas can be upscaled. And just to give us all ideas, or to give everyone ideas of what to look out for, a different way of thinking when choosing what equipment to put in, to choose the order, and listening to the client quite a lot. So what I've noticed changing in audio installation, you know, in the last couple of years, in the past when someone needed a sound system, it was take a speaker, bang it on the wall, and hope it doesn't fall down. Now, imagine that you're a restaurant owner or a venue owner or a bar. If you own, let's say, an Italian restaurant, chances are there's 10 more Italian restaurants down the road. So clients are having to make their restaurants different. If it's a restaurant or bar, whatever it is, they are putting so much effort. They're going to have, they're going to make their, their restaurant look better than the 10 down the road. They're going to make the so aesthetics are so important. They want to make these look so cooler, cooler than the Italian one just next door or the bar down the road. They're going to do something different. They're not just going to, oh, well, we serve food. I'm seeing a lot of weird stuff coming out. I always read articles about bizarre restaurants, bar. They're going to have their waiters, I don't know, serving the food on while rollerblading. And all of these things, we might not think about it, but it does affect us as audio installers. Let's take aesthetics. Aesthetics are so important. If someone decides they're going to put in huge, beautiful chandeliers in their restaurant that no one's ever seen in a restaurant before, well, that's better. So you can't go hang a big speaker in front of that chandelier. That's going to ruin it. If they got something like I gave an example of a draw card, um, waiters on rollerblades. Well, that's very cool. But now we, we can't run a wire across the floor. They're going to trip. Uh, we can't have speakers at low level. They're going to rollerblade into those speakers. These are things that all affect us. Mixed-use venues. I'm finding that a lot of venues are no longer just a restaurant. They're no longer just a bar. You find there's a coffee shop. Monday to Friday, we're a coffee shop. Saturday morning, we have poetry. Saturday night, we have a DJ come in. Uh, Sundays, we book it out for weddings. That one place, if someone invests so much time and money into their venue, they're going to try and get as much out of it as possible. And that affects us. That system has to do a lot more. Health and safety is becoming so important, you know, and it's becoming more regulated and ensuring that we are compliant. We can't just throw a speaker on the roof and hope it doesn't fall down. We've got to make sure that it complies with all the stuff. Evacuation system, little things. If we're doing a simple little restaurant, if there's a fire in the building and we're cranking loud music and People might not hear the fire alarms going off. Can our system mute? Can it connect to a, a fire evac system? Little things like that. Another thing I'm finding is that venues and restaurants and any type of business are, for, are using less staff. Um, anything down to my local McDonald's now has one person who takes your order over the phone. They have two computer screens. So they're doing two orders at once, and they're taking your money, and they're passing you cold drinks. People are using as few staff as possible and trying to be more efficient. And also staff teams tend to not stick around in companies very long. You know, a year in a company and they want to go to the next job. Does that affect them? Of course it affects audio installation. Because I can teach Laura, I can say, Laura, we put in this new system. This is how it works. Turn those knobs. That's how it goes. But Laura's gone in six months' time. And now she's She's been replaced by a bull. Does bull know how to use the system? No, he doesn't. So he breaks it. 
he fiddles, he presses a knob he shouldn't, and what happens? That system no longer works. So we have to make sure that the system is operated by someone who knows. I also found that in hotels and conference centers in the past, it would have a dedicated, it wasn't unusual to have a dedicated sound guy or AV technician who was there to look after all the equipment. People aren't spending that. They might have now one person who paints the buildings, uh, runs the sound system, does the gardening, is the IT guy. He's doing 20 jobs at once. He's not going to put as much effort into the AV, number one. And number two, he's not going to know as much. He's a jack of all trades, master of none. So we don't have that specialized staff. We don't have as many staff. We don't, we've got people who aren't going to care as much and people are leaving. Less on our back of house, back of house, office areas, uh, storage rooms. Those are getting smaller and even fewer. And in some many restaurants, it's very open. How does that affect us? Well, we don't have somewhere to put our equipment anymore. Things are far away, they're hidden. Um, we've got less space, less safe places for our equipment, not ideal. People want integration. People are getting smart homes. They're going to the homes that press one button on their cell phone and the whole place lights up, the aircon changes. Well, we want that in our work as well. Wouldn't it be great? We pick up our phone, we can change the aircon, we can change the audio, everything in one place. That's what people expect of us. Cheaper construction. I've, we recently had a shopping mall that we installed in. And we couldn't believe that the entire roof was made out of the thin plastic and it affected us. Our ceiling speakers couldn't grip. So we have to look at these new construction methods. Plastics and thinner walls affect us and our acoustics affect us with maybe having bleed into sound going into the neighbors, which is a huge complaint I get uh, often is our sound system is great, but our neighbor keeps hearing us and is complaining. Changes in sources. People are not putting in CDs anymore. They're using MP3s, Spotify, music streaming services, YouTube. That's all compressed audio. So we're really starting with bad audio quality and we got to make it sound good. These are all the changes. And people are able to have better sound quality in their homes. You can go now and buy a cheap, very well-priced, cheap soundbar, a nice, simple JBL soundbar and put it in your house. And you look and you go, wow, that sounds amazing. And then you go to the restaurant down the road and it doesn't sound as good. So people are expecting higher quality. They're exposed to high quality audio in their home. And therefore they know, even your average Joe knows what a bad sound system sounds like. It's not just us technicians going, oh, I can't believe how crap that place sounds. Everyone's doing it because they got great quality in their homes. I felt like years ago, this was sort of, what we took into consideration when we went for a small to medium audio solution. Um, I'm not going to go through it all, but just, just briefly. And I feel like in the last year or two, or even a bit longer, the list has grown to that. It's becoming this big, big list. And these are this is my list of things I believe we should be looking out for. Um, we should be looking out for. And I'm going to go into a little bit more later. I'm not going to read it. I don't want to be one of those people who read my presentation. But you can see there how much there is, how much there is to consider. Um, and a lot of this, and we can look at this and go, you know what, I'm doing a tiny little job. It's a small little tiny restaurant. It's a small background music system. Is it really so important to consider so much? And I believe it is, but we don't have to go through every little thing. And there's tips and tricks, and that's what I'm going to focus now on, is tips and tricks on how to find this information quickly, easy, simply, and in a slightly different way. So what do we do when we want to design a system or consider how to put together a system? The first thing people do is they go and they look at the room, look around, eh, and put a speaker there, chuck one there, job done, that'll do the job. And I wanna change that thinking a little bit. I want us to think more about the client because when we just say, that'll work, that'll sound great, put a sub there, put a whatever here, it might be a good idea to us, but can, is that gonna work for the client? So I wanna start a little bit differently and start by talking to the client. So I have a, I, I have a job that we're going to, that we're gonna spec a system together for. And I'm not gonna tell you how big it is. I'm not gonna tell you the, anything about this because first we're gonna start with the client. So we don't know what the room looks like. I'm not even telling you what kind of venue it is. 
we're just going to have a simple statement, something a client might say to us in passing, something we might talk over the phone or over uh, Zoom over. It could even just be a simple email. And just by listening to the client, we can work out so much of those consideration points by talking to our client, listening to what they want, and we can translate that into our terms. So here's something a client might say to us. So this is Samantha, the, tra the traditional coffee shop owner. And Samantha says to us, I'm tired of loud, noisy coffee shops. Immediately, we can say, well, she wants a background music system. You know, she hates loud coffee shops. This isn't one of those coffee shops where they're blasting dance music or, you know, very loud, upbeat coffee shop, if she says that. You know, she wants something just soft in background. She says, I want my coffee shop to be a place where customers come and relax. Well, relax, what does that tell us? She's not going to be playing heavy metal music. You know, that's not a relaxing, a relaxing environment, acoustic, gentle music. And what does that tell us straight away? Well, if we're playing acoustic music, genre of music was on my list there. If we're listening to acoustic, gentle, laid back music, well, we immediately know I don't need subwoofers. I don't need subs if we're listening to nice acoustic music. It's not necessary. If we don't have the budget for it, if we don't have the space for it, it's not necessarily Thing. We don't need large 12-inch speakers. We can use something small, something that's pleasant. So, uh, one place to relax, enjoy their coffee and croissant, or catch up with an old friend. Music is nice, but, uh, but it's not that important. So audio is just music is nice. When someone says music is nice, it's not a high priority. Audio is not a high priority for this person. She's not sitting there critiquing every frequency. And can I hear the cowbells? gently in the background and can I hear what the what the keyboard player was thinking about on the day that this was recorded she's not an audiophile she just wants something gentle simple and if she's not into music and she's not into sound she's not going to be a good operator we can tell that already the worst drivers in the world are people who aren't interested in cars people who drive a car but have no interest in cars are the worst drivers they're doing it for the need, for, because they have to, not because they want to. So they're not very good at it and they don't really care. People who are not into audio don't really care. They're not going to be sitting there, you know, finicking over how it works and how it does. They just want to switch it on and leave it. So we want something that's easy, manageable. You know, there isn't a back of house. What does that tell us? Um, I think I might have jumped. There isn't a back of house. Um, so my, my presentation is actually a little bit blocked by my little window here. We'll have seated areas with an open coffee bar. So seat, uh, seated areas with an open coffee bar. So I'm saying that if we hear something like that, what is important? They want people to have conversations. They want people to be in this open area. They want to hear the music, but it needs to be very low volume. Because if we're having conversations, we know this is a very low volume sound system. But when a sound system is low volume, we usually end up with spots where we can hear it here and we can't hear it here. It's a big mistake people often make. So it's very good that we get the coverage very well. So because it's a low volume and an open area, we would rather say, and we're not going to be playing loud doof doof music or heavy rock music. It's gentle acoustics, as we learned earlier. We can say very simply, well, rather than going for big Speakers. Let's go for small speakers, but lots of them. So we get a nice coverage and we don't need the low end of a large speaker or subs or anything. You know, if we're playing a lot of hard music, metal, dance, we might go for less speakers that are larger to give us, you know, the warmth of that. But this we already know we can change. There isn't a back of house and all admin will take place in the corner of the coffee bar. So what's that? Mustn't take space, we don't have a place to put a big rack of amplifiers, we don't have a nice lockup place, uh, we want it out of sight, we don't want uh, you know, a whole bunch of sound equipment that people are going to see, we don't have anywhere to hide it, so we need something small, whatever we're going to do needs to be small, out of the way. What's important to me is the coffee, I want smells to draw customers, not crazy decor, I want to keep the look and feel simple and open, so what is what does that tell us? Oh, we read that one. We need low profile. 
She doesn't want to see speakers. Speakers are going to ruin her decor. She wants things hidden. We don't want to see it. In a perfect world, there'll be imaginary speakers. Sound will come out of the cloud. So we need to keep the look of the equipment very hidden. As hidden as possible, as blended in. We, we want to try and hide as much as we can or go for stuff that blends in with the decor, not anything sticking out. I quit my job and put my last cent into this business because coffee is my passion. Well, that tells us already, quite obvious, she doesn't have any money. When she's not interested in audio, she's put her last cent into this business, she's got no money. We need to come up with something that's going to be budget friendly. And the big thing that, that usually means to people is, oh, we have to go for rubbish. They put in cheap rubbish stuff, and I want to show that we don't need to. There are ways to do a system for her needs that's high quality, going to last long, and not going to break the bank. So just from her little statement, we've learned so much. We need a background music system that's low profile, hard to see, well hidden, small, out of the way amplifiers or whatever equipment we need to operate it. It needs to be easy to operate. It um, must be very budget friendly. It must be extremely easy to operate because you know they're not going to have any audio text on site. We just need something that's going to do simple background music, well covered, um, and matches the decor, or is not visible, even better. So now we've learned so much, now we can look at the space. So let's say this is Samantha's coffee shop. Just a generic picture I found of Google, but it'll serve a purpose. Without speaking to anyone, without doing anything, we can look at the space and we can learn a couple of things. So the first thing I notice, look at those light fittings and the air vents. Those are recessed light fittings, meaning they go into the roof. They're actually cut out and pushed into the roof. Just the front is exposed. And with that big air vent that we have next to it there, we know that this is a recessed, meaning there's space above. So we can put, most probably put ceiling speakers in this place, which is great because they're more hidden, more out of the way. And we've learned that with a quick look at the roof. Light fittings and air vents give us big clues. We'll notice that, as Samantha said, the space is very open. There's no pillars in the way. There's no, uh, there's no places for us necessarily to mount speakers. You can see the walls are full, the middle's open. There's not a lot of space to mount speakers, but it's very open, which means it's also going to be a uniform sound. We don't have little rooms and big rooms. It's one open area. We've got minimal furniture, which means we could have a bit of reflection. Um, uh, you know, a lot of echo and that sort of thing, and that can give us a problem. Once again, reflective surfaces, we've got tiles on the floor, tiles are going to echo. Once again, we want to keep the volume as low and spread our speakers out so that we don't have one loud speaker bouncing off that floor, causing a terrible echo. And even more reflective surfaces there on the glass wall. You can see we don't really have a back of house just an open coffee bar. So what does that tell us? Our equipment's gonna be exposed to horrible conditions. Coffee could be spilt on that amplifier. Coffee beans are gonna be dropped on top of it. Um, it's not, we can't lock it up necessarily. We can't put in an ice safe cabinet. So it needs to be something that if it gets locked up, it's not gonna overheat. It's not something that's going to have fans blocked up. So let's consider that when we're doing it. Okay, now here's something that people struggle with a lot, how to choose the position and the quantity of speaker. And what I've found is that people struggle with the idea of understanding the coverage of a speaker. So if I say to you, this speaker can give me 40 by 60 degree coverage, people struggle with that idea. People say to me, but if I just stick a speaker over there, <clears throat> I'm sure I can just hear it down there. And yeah, maybe you can, but it won't be clear, it won't be nice, excuse me. <clears throat> So the idea is, how do we explain? What is the simplest way? And I found that what people do understand, whether you're a technician, whether you're a client, whether you're, people tend to understand how lights work. So I want you to imagine that, this, let's forget that we're talking about sound for a moment and let's talk about a spotlight. Everyone from when you were a child had a little play torch. You've got a torch in your phone. And if I take my phone and I hold it up and I switch on the torch on it, yes, if I point it in that direction, yes, I'm going to get a little bit of light there. There's going to be a bit of spill, and it won't be completely black there. But I 
it's not going to be very good lighting. It te- spotlight and the light tends to focus in one area. Now, if we for a moment pretend that we were doing, there's our venue again. And let's pretend we say, well, the client says, well, why can't I just put one ceiling speaker up, bang, in there? We'll hear it everywhere. Yeah, probably. But let's pretend that was a light. If we just put up one spotlight, yes, it is going to create a little bit of light at the far end of the room, but it's not going to be very nice. It's going to be horribly dark. It's going to be awkward. And we end up with the spotlight. You end up with wherever it is below. It's going to be very bright there. And as we get further and further, further away from the light, it tends to fade out, fade out, fade out. We call this an audio hotspot. So right below that spotlight, we're going to get that nice bright in my drawing there, you can see that red dot. That becomes our center, which in audio we call, like I said, the hotspot. So it's loud there and as we move away. And the problem in a situation like a coffee shop or restaurant is table number one is going, oh, the music is just too damn loud. I can't hear myself think it's so loud. But table 10 is going, I can't hear a thing. And that's what audio coverage is about. So we can get a speaker that's got a wider angle, but if the roof is low, you can see how if it's a spotlight, the higher we lift our torch, the bigger our circle gets. And sound works in a very similar way. If our roof is low and we put that spotlight low, we're only going to get a very small circle of light. So we want to, we've got a choice. We can either use a floodlight. The floodlights are terrible. It's like putting a horn speaker, the same sort of thing. It's going to, yes, it's going to light up the room, but imagine when you look at that floodlight shining in your eye. It's a horrible, horrible sensation. Quickly check, I'm getting a time. I don't want to go too long. Right. It's a horrible sensation when someone's got this big fat floodlight shining in your eye and you try and turn here and it catches the corner of your eye and it's just an unpleasant feeling. But yes, in theory, it does light the building. And that's like putting up a horn speaker. It'll, it'll cover a big, large area, but it's unpleasant. And it's a constant explain to people that people go, I don't want lots of speakers because I don't want loud music. Well, actually, more speakers can often be lower volume. Because if I have two speakers in this room, I have to turn them very loud so that everyone can hear. It's like saying if I can only buy two lights, for whatever reason, I can only put two lights up in my venue, I have to make sure that those lights are so bright that it's going to light up every nook and cranny of the building. Yes, it'll light up every nook and cranny, but when you're close to that light, it's going to be unpleasant. That's going to shine in your eyes, it's going to burn you, it's going to be terrible, it's going to create shadows. Same as a speaker. So rather than buying two massive giant floodlights, why don't we go in and spend our money on 10 little lights? And that's actually going to make things more pleasant. So it's more light, but it's actually creating less light in different areas. So we get a nicer distribution. So let's, once again, let's talk about lighting. And it's so much easier to explain this, because how do I explain audio bad placement of speakers in a picture. It's very hard, but if I show you an image like the top left, and this is something I see very often, people go and mount ceiling speakers, a whole whack load of ceiling speakers, and they go, ah, why well, put them in the middle of the room? They look ugly. It's going to put them all right against the wall. And what happens? Look at that first picture. We end up with that very bright wall. Look how well lit that wall is, but look at the rest of the room, how dull and dim it is. It's exactly what happens with audio. So, I couldn't get a nice picture of a, a spotlight on a wall, but if you imagine that second picture, the top right picture, imagine that that's a light on a wall. And we can start to say, well, if we had to turn that light at a different angle, where's it going to light? So if I want to mount a light, a, a light on this wall over here, and I'm going to point that light here, it's going to make light up there beautifully, but over here, not so much. So where is the best position for the speaker? Which corner of the room is going to be the best place to light up an area? So think about a speaker rather as a light. So you might get a speaker that says, this speaker does a 45 degree coverage. So very easy. Take your hand. That's 90 degrees. The square, half is 45. And imagine, put that in front of your eyes and look at what's between your fingers. Look at that. I'm only getting a very narrow pattern. So if I mounted that speaker here, I'm leaving it half the room. But if I angle the speaker at this angle, I can get a room a lot better. Um, and it's, if you start to think about that, and it's something it might look weird, but just give yourself that idea. Put your hands there. Look at if this is a spotlight, if this is a floodlight. A floodlight's like a wide speaker. A spotlight's like a very narrow speaker. 
if I'm doing a ceiling speaker, let's pretend we're looking down at our value. The speaker's here and it's coming down. It's all very well, we're gonna get a nice circle here. Where can we see dead spots? Where are we gonna see dark spots in light? And it's so easy to visually think about it when you're thinking about light. And it really does work in a very similar way. We can go overboard. You can look at the bottom left picture. Look how many spotlights are on. That room is beautifully lit. And that's great. We don't have any shadows and we think that's a perfect situation. But sometimes when you've got too many lights close together, we start to get weird shadows. You stand below it and you see your shadows in 10 directions. Well, that also happens. Sound reflects. When you've got too many speakers, it could also reflect. And sometimes it's just not necessary. So, you know, you think about ceiling speakers like that. Another common one, let's look at the bottom right picture. People often say, I don't want to see the speaker. It's ugly. I don't want to see it. Oh, we've got a bit of a wall. Let's hide the speaker behind that wall. Let's put it behind that piece of furniture. And it seems like a great idea, but then how do, people say, how will it affect my order? You start saying to people, well, it might be a bit muffled and it might not come up. And people don't quite understand that. But let's say we put a light behind the wall. Now you can see in that thing, we've got lights behind a wall. So it's not a direct light. The light creeps out and it looks very bright in that corner, but look how faded that light gets very quickly. We have this one strip of bright light and it gets very dark so quickly. And that's what audio is going to do. It's going to fade out, but audio is, the speaker wouldn't be that long thing, it would only be one little piece of light. So we're going to end up with this one bright spot. The light's not going to come through crisp. We're going to end up with dark spots. You can see if you look at the left of that room, it's nice and bright. And we look at the right, it's not bright at all. It's just light. While any light loses its brightness as you get further away from it, that's going to lose very quickly. And that's what happens when you hide a speaker, when you block a speaker. So rather find a speaker that's going to be more aesthetically pleasing than hide it behind something. Um, however, that light does create a very nice effect. We can say, well, it's a very cool effect. That I'm not trying to get the light to be necessarily my main light. It's just a cool effect. And sometimes we do that with audio too. We hide a speaker behind a mannequin. Behind it, behind a prop. We've done this in amusement parks where we hide it behind some sort of a prop. And when people approach it, it's hello, or it talks, or it does something. You'll find this in a lot of amusement parks behind maybe a mannequin or a robot or something. And there we want the speaker to be behind the sound that it comes from. But that's an effect. It's not our main primary audio. So we live with the consequences. It's only when someone's very close to that thing that we want to hear that sound. So we live with it. So if you start looking at audio as a light source, it, it actually comes very easy. And I find that I don't have to explain to people or tell them math or figures or calculations or for every square meter, you need this many speakers. Just pretend you're lighting a building. If you're very confused, take your cell phone, switch on the torch, look at how we can go further back, closer, we get a spot. Let's see, well, it's a narrow speaker, so it's not gonna be covered as well. And that becomes a lot easier for us as technicians, as us installers to think about. And it also becomes easy to explain to our client. Client goes, why can't you just put the speaker in a corner? I go, well, would you just put one light in a corner? No, it will give me terrible light. Well, it's the same thing. And just explain to people that actually lots of small light give you a better, brighter light than one giant floodlight, more pleasant. Same as audio. And clients ex tend to respond to that very well. And it's also easy for us when we don't know all the maths and we're starting out in audio. It's a great way to think about those positions and it helps us work out quantities. Now, this is that list that I had up earlier where I didn't talk too much about it. And I said, this is a long list of things that we should and want to consider about audio. And just from listening to a simple speech by our client, just by having a quick, quick, but then we walk on site, we looked at a picture of our Samantha's coffee shop and considering how speak we kept in mind that speakers can be thought of as lights and how we can position it just by that little bit we can tick off so much of this list we know what type of use it's background we know that we've worked out the coverage we've worked out our budget um, we've worked out the client specific requirements Who's going to be operating? Anyone who can make coffee will probably be operating the system. The genre of music, which does affect, it is very important to consider, unless it's mixed use. But even then, we can talk about that. 
Um, there's very few ticks there. We've looked at aesthetics, like I said, how important it is. We don't want to see the speaker. We want it to be hidden. The colors, we've seen the color of the roof. So we can tick so much off the list. We now know so much about what the client wants, what's going to work in the venue, what is needed. And we now know that best is going to be a ceiling speaker. We can fit ceiling speakers. We want to go for a small ceiling speaker because we don't need bass. We don't need um, we don't need bass, we don't need high end, we don't need loud volume, but we want to get really good coverage. So more speakers, the better, more smaller speakers. We know that we need a small amplifier or operating. We need something that's not going to get hot, is not going to be too fussy about a little bit of dust, that fans or anything. Something that doesn't need to be mounted in a rack, as few pieces of equipment as possible. Something that only needs a little bit of audio, you know, maybe one, maybe two inputs. A ceiling speaker that's going to be as hidden as possible, as out of sight. Um, we don't want big speakers, we want big large goals, something that blends in. We want the ceiling colors white, we could also do black, there's a lot of black things there. But if we were doing a bit of a look and something that we want to stand out, we might have gone for a black ceiling speaker to match those light fittings that we saw. Um, you can see there's black light fittings and black things there, but we want our speakers to be hidden, so we want to go for a wire speaker. We know so much now that we can choose our system. And like I said, I'm not gonna do a, a talk now on how to choose the system. One of the things I recommend is going to your local Harman agent or any sound shop and saying, this is what I need, I need this, 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 as we've just discussed, design me a system. So I'm not gonna tell you how to choose, but let's say we this is the system we've come up with. Using JBL 8124s, it's a small low profile speaker, Flat grill, very budget friendly. I've chosen nine of them just for the hell of it, using a small JBL amp. This is high quality stuff. This is JBL, but it's very budget friendly. Now, like I said, I'm in South Africa, but I did a quick Amazon search to see what this would cost in America. If we bought this retail on Amazon, this whole system could cost us about $500. Now that's full retail. If we're buying from our agents, we should get that a lot cheaper and we can hopefully sell it for $500. And that's very, you know, it's a very good price for a small, simple system. That amplifier is easy to use. Look at it. It's got four little knobs, one big one. We can put a label on it. It's so simple to operate. It doesn't have fans. It's small. Those little amps are like that big. It's going to fit in. This system will suit our client beautifully. Now we need to plan the actual installation. So we've got the job. Great. Fantastic. Let's go physically put it in. So I'm not going to go into low and high impedance. I know that there is some other webinars in the Harman Group about you know, some of these webinar, uh, how to install systems, um, you know, how to calculate 100 volt line or 70 volt line if you're in America. So I'm not going to go into the calculation, but on a very simple thing, if we've got nine speakers and we tap them at six watts, which is full power, we're drawing 54 watts, so our amps 80 watts, cool, we're happy. And something to just keep in mind is we want to keep our cable length efficient. So people always think that with 100 volt line and speakers, we have to wire it in the sort of in out, in out, in out. We can do it in any pattern if it's 100 volt line, which saves us in cable, helps us with our budget. And if we're only drawing 50 odd watts, we can go for a very thin, thin cable. We don't need any fancy cable. Something maybe we can do in another lecture, or we can look at another you know, 100 volt line system and how to work that all out. But if it's only 50 odd watts, which is more than enough for this little restaurant, and we can even go down, we can use a thin cable, we can look for the shortest cable routes, you know, by connecting our speakers to save money officially. So we look at, this is, this is our wiring diagram. We use our wiring diagram and we say, how much cable do we need? How are we gonna connect this? So we've got a plan for when we install. The other nice thing about 100 volt line and the sort of system is if we've got one speaker in a corner that needs to be a little bit softer, we can tap it down as I've given an example there. It's a three watt speaker. So we know we've got power on our amps. We know that we can use a thin cable. We know that we don't need much cable. So we can quote the client very little on cabling. So I like to think that installation can happen in one of three ways or in three ways. So there's pre-construction, during construction, and post-construction. So the client can come to you in one of three ways. Client can say to you, hey, 
we're planning on building a coffee shop. This is our plan. We're going to start construction next week. Here's the job. What do we need to do? The second is the client comes to us, hey, we're building a coffee shop. We're busy in the middle of it now. Construction is underway. And the third is, hey, I've got a coffee shop. It's already open. We're already trading for business. I need a sound system. Obviously, first prize is pre-construction because then we can have the most planning. But nothing ever goes to plan. We always land up often in the situation of an existing, you know, existing shop. So let's start with ideal situation. And, and we have pre-construction. The first thing I always do is I found that we can, you, we can utilize other contractors so well. You may say, you know, I don't have enough step ladders. I'm just getting into this. I don't know how to cut holes in a roof. I don't know how to do a lot of stuff. Speaking to under, other contractors can make your life an absolute pleasure. These guys can ruin your installation or help you along. Speak to the other guys. Speak to the electrician. Speak to the plumber. Speak to the guy doing the flooring. Say, so, hey, when are you going to put up the roof? What materials are you planning and using? Will it hold? My speaker weighs two kilograms. Will your roof carry it? Maybe the electrician, when he's putting in conduits, he can stick conduits in for you as well if there's any difficult. Put draw wires in for you. Um, ask about their timelines. You know, should I, you know, you don't want to be cutting speaker holes in the roof just after the guy's put brand new carpets in. He's going to hate you. And the first thing he's going to go is and tick your amplifier in because you messed up his carpets. Work together as a team. They can do so much. Something that we've done quite a lot is have actually sometimes found the contractors and actually employed them. So, you know, these guys are already pulling wires in the roof. Why must we complicate things? Why must we go and fight for our space in the roof? Speak to an electrician. Say, hey, here's a couple of bucks. How much will you charge me to pull my wire in while you're pulling those things? Hey, you're cutting light holes. Would, it, would you be able to help me by cutting? This is how big my speaker hole needs to be. Could you cut it for me? It's less people on site. It makes your job easier. It makes the client happier because they're not having so many people on top. It's good for social distancing. We're not having so many contractors. Um, so pre-construction, we can find out. We can do a lot more planning. We can do a lot of stuff. Something I put there is buy a round of coffee. You won't believe how that can help your installation down the line. You buy that electrician a cup of coffee. And you know what? When you're desperate because you lost your wire cutters, he's going to help you. He's going to loan you his. He's going to help you out very quickly it goes a long way it can help you a lot now if we got in a pre-construction then we can use the two more steps but if we only get in during construction why that's great is we can try and let's say we're doing we're doing seating speakers let's try and pre-cut our holes we don't want to go cutting holes after all the furnitures and after the beautiful carpets are in everyone's going to hate us but we don't want to put our ceiling speakers in before paint's done because then the paint is going to paint over our speakers so we can say, let's cut the holes, find the correct position. We've spoken to the contractors. We're not going to get in the air conditioner guy's way. We're going to cut those holes. We can even drop some wires. We can pull cables into positions that are easily accessible. So maybe we're not going to put the wire in every speaker hole because it's going to get missing. It's going to get painted on. It's going to get pulled out. But we can say from the amplifier to the roof is a very difficult route. Let's get it in before they put the tiles on the, on the walls and leave it in a trapdoor area, somewhere that's going to be easy for us to find later on. Uh, it does help us quite a lot. Um, well, it's also great to cut things like do drilling and speaker holes before we, before, you know, final touch-ups is accident happen. Doesn't matter how long you've been doing this, you cut a ceiling speaker, you crack the roof, you damage it, you slip with the saw, you cut the hole, you damage it. Well, if you bought a round of coffee beforehand and you've now cracked the roof, the painters are still going to come in and do touch-ups. You bought the guy a cup of coffee, he's going to have no problem touching up your mess, doing a little bit of plastering, painting it. Client will never know you've made that mistake. Or even if they know, say, don't worry. I've spoken to your painter. We're all on track. It's going to get taken care of. But if you damage that roof after everything's in and everyone's off site, you're going to have a problem. To try and get as much what I call the dirty work, the cutting, the drilling, 
anything that you could cause damage, ideally we want to get that done during construction. And last thing I put there is consider paying other contractors to perform some of the messy work. They're cutting holes. You know, we currently have a job on now where we're putting a whole lot of outdoor speakers on the site and we have to trench all the cables underground in conduits. And I went to site and I noticed there were a whole team of electricians doing this job already. Because they're already doing it, when I offered them a little bit of money or we came up with an idea where they could go and pull my cables for me, they're charging me so little money that I still make money on the job. The client's happy because they don't have too many contractors, you know, damaging each other's stuff. I'm saving money by hiring a whole team to go and pull wires there. Everyone wins and he's made a bit of money, a little bit of extra pocket money, the electrician. So it's a great idea. If he's cutting ceiling speakers, he's already got the tools to cut the ceiling light. It's not very difficult for him to cut that. It also helps because he's worked out the center of the room already. He's worked out a nice line of light. So it's easy for him to do. It's a lot easier. So that's something you can do. Or just working together with other contractors. You know, it really can help you out a lot to make friends with all these with other contractors and do that. I put a point there, ensure your cables are distinguishable from other contractors. Something I've seen happen quite a lot, you pull a wire, um, you know, with modern audio and modern everything, everyone runs cat cable, cat data cable for everything. We're using it in audio. Aircon guys are using it for control. Electricians are even using it for relay control. The point of sale people, the IT people, everyone's running a cat cable. And if we all, and it's, I've seen it happen a million times, 20 contractors all pull in the same looking gray data cable and no one knows who's is who's and people end up damaging other people's connecting the wrong cable, cables go missing. Something as simple as making yours a different color or what I do is I make a whole lot of stickers with our label machine and we stick on the end of our wire. We have a wire dangling that we're only going to connect later on in the next stage. Put a little sticker, sound guy cable, audio cable, do not touch. Something as simple like that so people can distinguish. We did a large job for a mall where they realized that there were going to be almost 30 different contractors pulling data cables. And we had a meeting, a post, uh, sorry, a pre-construction meeting with all the contractors, and we realized that we were going to run into a big problem. And we came up with a, an idea, all of us together, that why don't we just, all the wires are going to be unseen. They're all going to be in cable trays high up in the roof. Let's assign colors. And every contractor was assigned a different color. We were assigned for audio yellow. And we put all, we got hold of yellow dotted cat cable, and all our cables were yellow. And where it helped us is one day, the site manager was furious to see these green cables messy hanging from the roof and he was furious and usually when that happens we all get, have to go to an emergency meeting and everyone has to say well, was it me it was you it was very obvious green was the aircon guys two seconds call the aircon guys and fix your wires they're messy so having distinguishable cables knowing that yellow is audio for example having stickers on it even if it's just taking a Sharpie, a marker, and writing audio cable, you know, non-electrical. A lot of the time we use electric uh, speaker wires that look like electrical wires, and that can be a little bit confusing. So that's also something that when we come to phase three, post-construction, we know we're not a, you know, our cables aren't going to go missing. They're not being connected to other things, unless you're in South Africa and they've been stolen for copper. That's a very common one here, unfortunately. I don't know how common that is anywhere else. Um, so now we've got to our third phase. So hopefully we've had our first two phases now in post-construction and we're hoping that we had those two phases and everything's fine. And we can go and just stick in our own. We've got the holes and all we have to do is go clip in our speakers and job done. Unfortunately, sound is either usually considered lost. It's one of the last things people think about or Hopefully we're getting it's an existing business and they now want to upgrade their sound or put in sound for the first time. And we're only able to install in an existing business. And simple something like explaining to the client about mess and noise can occur. We're gonna cut ceiling speakers. We're gonna drill in the wall. People don't think about that, hey, I've got clients in my coffee shop. I can't have you cutting here. And it can cause a lot of fights. Just simple thing, explain to the client from day one, hey, 
the restaurant's open, we need a mount speaker. Is there a time we can work? Are you closed on a Monday? Are you quiet on a Tuesday? Can we work at night? Something as simple as that can avoid confrontation, can avoid you damaging furniture. Um, and we would think, oh, well, that's so obvious that when I put a speaker in the roof, of course I'm going to make dust all over the place. I'm going to do a double check in there. Oh, it's running low. Of course we're going to make this, but that's not obvious to a client. People don't think about that. Hey, I need a sound system, just get a speaker up. That's actually going to make a lot of mess, cutting a roof. Simple something like that. Ideally, we want to put the equipment off the painting. You know, painters always cover ceiling speakers and drop paint in our speakers. Make sure your team works. There's nothing worse than putting up a brand new, beautiful white ceiling speaker and you've got fingerprints everywhere. Having water for your team, having gloves, keeping that stuff clean. Buy a vacuum cleaner. It's one of the, you know, people don't, your client doesn't care what brand of drill you have. That's something you might like, but having something simple as walking on site after working and having your own vacuum cleaner in the back of your work van, cleaning up the mess after you, you won't believe how that impresses a client and makes everyone much happier and you don't end up with a fight. Because when your client's upset that you've made a mess or damaged their tables or left dust everywhere, they're going to find other problems with their system. So simply as cleaning up after yourself, having a vacuum cleaner, little tip there. So we are pretty much at the end here. But little things that I like to say post installations, the system's in. Something also besides a vacuum cleaner that I definitely recommend you should invest in is a label machine. They're not expensive. Something that puts beautiful labels. Label everything. Label every knob. I like to lay up often. I print hundreds of stickers over amplifiers that say do not adjust. Big, bold, and I stick it over the knob. So if I have an amplifier and I don't want them adjusting the volume there, I actually put a sticker so that they can't turn it. And be clear, someone goes, oh, I don't want to hear, oh, you accidentally turned that knob. Oh, the client's an idiot. They turned that knob. No, I warned you, don't turn the knob. It's clear what you want to adjust. And use client language. Use user in language. Don't call it line level three. What does line level mean to a client? No, it's iPad, iPod. It's a left, uh, Jessica's laptop. Laptop at the front counter. Simple language that the client understands with a label. Put in uh, something I do often that helps a lot, an emergency contact. You install a system a week later, they month later, they can't operate it, they can't find your phone number, they call their uncle, just come and fix this, any damages your system. Put that label maker, put there, your phone number, Jonathan, cell phone number, call me if you've got a problem. They're going to call you, they're not going to stuff up your system. Ensure the client has got their preferred music. Something that we find is the client hasn't decided what music source they want. So we go and test with our cell phone, sounds great. They go get a little Spotify music player, plug it in, sounds like garbage. Set the system to what they're actually using. Get their CD player, get their music, find out exactly what they're going to use and EQ and set the system to their music, not yours, their source equipment. It makes a big difference. It's the big thing we're trying to avoid is we don't want callbacks. I don't want to get a call from my client a week later to say, it's crap, it doesn't work, it's broken. I don't want to get that. The call I want to get from my client is, we're opening our second restaurant and you were amazing. You cleaned up, your system works, I can operate it, I want you back. So we've got to, after the installation, we've got to make sure we're not getting a callback. So we want to check that that's in there. Test system with the client source. Set up a time with the client and as many staff members who operate as possible time to explain. Don't just teach the owner of the store. The owner of the store is going to be there Monday and then she's going to get bored and leave. And she's going to leave her managers and her staff. She's not going to be there. Find out the actual people and as many people as possible who are allowed to operate. Whether it be the cleaner, the person with a bucket of mop, the more people who know how to operate it, the less issues you're going to have. Tell your client, let me teach everybody or Show the client, make sure they're happy, and then grab as their staff. And remember, staff turnaround is high these days. So we want to teach everyone, not just one manager, because when that one manager leaves, we want to make sure that there's still some people who know how to use it, and hopefully they'll pass the knowledge down. And by, of course, by labeling, we want to make sure that it's easy for the next staff member to come in, even if they haven't received training. Hopefully they can operate it without any training. Final walkthrough. 
People often EQ and set systems and listen to it when the shop's empty. Then all the furniture comes in, sounds different. So we want to maybe do a second visit to the thing. So we set the system, we're happy, we maybe just pop in a little bit later, a week later, check that it still sounds good, even though they have now bought couches and put mirrors on the wall and go, oh, it's a little bit reflective, we can adjust this, um, we can compensate. Ensure client knows what to clean and what not to clean. So people often, I've seen this, it sounds silly, but I've seen where people go, hey, you know, I don't know why our system's not working. I look after it so well. Just last week, it looked a little dusty, so I took a nice damp cloth and I scrubbed the amplifier clean. Yeah, your, your amp now has water damage. Sounds silly, but it happens. People think I've, I've had a client who their system constantly overheated and we couldn't figure out why. And one, every time I went there, the system was fine and they kept complaining about oh, the system would overheat. One day I did an impromptu visit, just happened to be in the neighborhood, popped in to say hi, and there was the rack with a big tablecloth over it, whole thing. And I said to the client, but what's this? And she goes, oh, we do it to keep the dust off the system. We want to keep it clean. And I said, but every time I've come here, I haven't seen a tablecloth covering the amplifier. She goes, oh, before you come, we try and be nice to you, John, we like you. So we took it off for you, so it's easy for you to see what's going on. And went, well, there's your whole problem. The system can't breathe, it's not getting air. So just explain simple things. Don't put water on it. I know it sounds obvious, but you know, remember we we don't want us we don't want to call our clients idiots. It's our fault if we're not explaining to them that water and amps don't go well together. Ceiling speakers are going to get dusty. Um, they are going to get maybe a spider weight on. Explain to them that a simple feather duster. If they want to use water, damp cloth. Don't use a host pipe. I know I'm being maybe over obvious, but just little things, explaining to clients how to maintain it. Um, something I tell clients, if the system's got fans, they can use, if they want to dust it, take a vacuum cleaner rather than a wet cloth. Um, little things like that. If just a two second explanation to client of how to clean or not to clean the system, believe it or not, can prevent a lot of damage. I've seen people take a feather duster often, and I think a feather duster is fine to a mixing console and dust the mixing console. Now all the knobs get moved and turned. And what happens? They feather dust it, knock the gain knob very high and put blow a speaker next weekend because they went like that. Well, they said to the client, well, they're actually better off not dusting it or make a note of where the knobs are or call us, let us do it for you. It's more revenue for us if we have to come in and clean their system. You know, if I send a technician out of my vacuum cleaner that's sitting in my van, or I come and clean their system or I dust it for them, it's just more revenue, especially, you know, when things are a little bit quiet, when you've got quiet times, uh, quiet times of the year, offer that as a service to your clients. Send them an email, hey, I'll come and clean your system for you. And the last little thing that I always like to do is we want to get more business. We hope that Samantha's little coffee shop becomes a chain. We're hoping next year there's going to be a... Samantha's coffee shop in every corner, every corner of the street. We want to get that business. We want our client to call us back every time. Something as simple as, you know, going there, being a guest does that for them. But also, sometimes you'll notice something very different. When you're walking around a restaurant testing audio, things can sound a lot different when you're actually sitting there and going, you know, it sounded great when I was walking around, but when I sit in this booth over here, doesn't sound very good. My audio is not clear. And you learn a lot by actually being a guest in your own installations, instead of just going to other people and critiquing them. Listen, be a guest, sit in different spots, support your client. Um, the client's happy because you're supporting them. They said, hey, I gave you money, you're giving me money. But also I feel I can start to see where the system works, where it doesn't work, and popping in I can also see that people aren't mistreating my system. I want my system to last for years and years and years so that when Samantha opens up her coffee shop every corner, I get the business. Um, little things like that just in prolonged systems. It makes clients happier, less, less downtime, less failures, less problems because we're not, we're ensuring that we're putting in a system that's easy to operate, something that we're helping them, op, you know, we're helping them by showing them constantly we're making it easy, we're guests, we're learning all the problems of our system. Little simple things make such a difference. Um, 
I know that this wasn't a very technical talk. I know that we didn't talk about how to connect stuff. I hope that's not what people were expecting. I'm hoping maybe I'll get invited back and I can talk about that. We can even do one webinar on how to physically cut a hole to put in a ceiling speaker, how to attach ceiling speakers, how to wire them. But I feel like before we even get to that stage, it is important to understand everything I've been through tonight, tonight for me, and how to put in the correct system from the start. On day one, we've got the right system for that client, and it's not going to get broken, it's not going to get fiddled with, it's not going to get mismanaged, misused, and end up, you know, us calling our clients idiots. The absolute last thing we want. Um, I hope that was all right. I hope I didn't talk too fast. I hope I wasn't too boring. Um, and yeah, hello, Mallory. You're back. Hi, I hope yes. I wasn't too long. No, it was great. We had a lot of people on the back end thanking you and saying this was a great session. If you have time, we do have a handful of questions that I would like to ask you. Oh, any of them about Mario Brothers in the background? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, funny. So the first question is, in a medium-sized venue for background music, what is better, more small speakers or fewer larger speakers? So that is, that's actually a fantastic question. And there isn't a one answer, I believe, fits all. And when I gave that example of Samantha the Coffee Shop, one of the things that I spoke about was genre of music. And I know that that doesn't always work because it can change. But let's say we've got a... So one of my clients is Hard Rock. I do all the design and systems for Hard Rock Cafe. Now, Hard Rock play a lot of hard rock music. They play a lot of loud music. They want lots of bass and a lot of high end. So for them, we need a larger speaker. Remember, larger speaker is not higher volume. It's just going to give us more low end, more bass. So we want that doof, doof. We want, the, we want to feel the drums, the rock music coming through. So we're going to go for a larger speaker, but we don't want to have a large speaker and a large speaker and a large speaker. So we're going to go for less large speakers. But if we're in a classical bar, you know, playing classical music, there we want to hear, wherever we walk, we want to hear the same level. We want to hear the keys, we want to hear the gentle. So more speakers are great, and we don't need the bass. But what if we have a venue that's sort of both? If it's mixed venue, you might find you need to do both, or maybe small speakers or subwoofers. So it really, and that's why I speak about genre of music. People often say, well, what's the difference what I'm playing? When I say, what, what kind of music are you playing? What is the vibe? I say, well, what's the bloody difference? It does make a difference. It answers that question. In a restaurant setting, as a general, I like lots of small speakers because I don't want table one to be different to table two to table three. I like to have the same even. I spoke about light. We want the same light. We don't want to have table one bright and table two in the dark. So I like to do that, but it's not always the right, you know, the right method. And sometimes we do need to spread them out. And a larger speaker is not always hard to tell people it's not more volume necessarily and it's not more coverage. It's usually just about, you know, the lower end diameter. So I hope that answers that. Great. The next question is, good analogy with the spotlights definitely helps me visualize a sound. In lighting, we overlap the lighting beams to give us good enough coverage. Is this principle um, applied to sound as well? So... I believe so. The lighting analogy is something that I, I came up with a few years ago because I found myself struggling to explain to other technicians and you guys starting out. And even in the uh, rental industry, in the live events industry, trying to explain to people where people put a loudspeaker way high. I, I used to find people putting a speaker on a massively high speaker stand and I go, but my ears here. And people just couldn't get that. They went, no, we must put it high. I went, what? imagine it's a light. We want to light it up. So, yes. And in some, so it's a great way to look at it. If, you know, getting that even coverage of lighting, getting an even flow. Lighting, guys, any electrician can understand the concept of not having a bright spot and a dark spot. But sometimes we actually want to reverse it. Sometimes you want, you think about a theater, you want a spotlight. Yeah, our main guy over there. We might want to have one spot that is louder. This is the, the loud section of the restaurant. That's the soft section of the restaurant. Sometimes you have a restaurant, like I said, mixed use. Maybe there's a band area. Maybe on weekends they have a, a live band play. Well, we want the stage area to be very loud, but some customers don't want loud music. They want to have a conversation, so they're going to sit over there. 
So we do want sometimes a loud area in the stage or the, even the dance floor of a nightclub. In the chill areas, if it's a nightclub, we want softer. So we do want to play with different levels. And once again, you can think about that light that we might want to put the speaker here so it's loud here, but the light fades out. We might want to spotlight an area. And it's, it's a very easy way to do it. So I think that the two do work very well together. You know, and clients, like I said, do understand and people understand light a lot better than audio, it seems. Perfect. The next question is, I make use of the 360 degree coverage when installing a room or home entertainment. Do you think this is a good practical aspect to use? Um, in some cases, yes. And like I said, I, you know, especially with audio, especially with audio installation, we don't want to take in home theater, people, there's, there's a lot of these home theater in a box. It's one solution fits all. And in restaurants, well, not restaurants, in any installed ones, we want it to be a little bit more custom. And sometimes we don't want perfect coverage, as I just said. We want a little bit softer here. Maybe there's a raised area, maybe there's a low, maybe there's a chill area. So something like that coverage could be good, but it doesn't take into effect a lot of the clients necessary. So if we look at Samantha's coffee shop again, as much as you, the coffee shop and the counter was in her coffee shop, and it's an open plan area, we actually don't want, we want it to be as quiet and we want as less low coverage as possible over the counter areas because we've got staff who are on the telephone, staff who need to talk to each other. And if we've got music there, we act as can disturb it. So we want it to, so that becomes a quieter area. So we, we actually might, if we put that building on a plot, when it's some sort of software or a plot, it might give us a beautiful coverage, but it doesn't tell us that actually in this spot, we want it to be quieter or we don't want sound because that's a, back of house area or a non-coverage area. So yes, it is a great tool, but I always tell people, listen to your customer, listen to your customer's needs. Think about their specific requirements as well. That's almost more important sometimes is understanding where they want sound and where they don't. And we know that people will have the speaker in an area where they don't want sound and it irritates stop. And because they're unable to turn it down, the solution often is to turn everything down or switch everything off which is not great. Perfect. The next question is, any tip about what level of knowledge of construction is needed and how to get that? Well, one of the things that I put in my presentation, which I was debating and doing, but I think it's so important, is I put a thing there where I said, a round of coffees goes a long way. It is, when you go to that site meeting or going there, buying the electrician, the builder, a cup of coffee, the amount of brownie points that that can gain, the amount of thing. And you can fake so much when you're learning. If you don't understand, hey, I've never heard of that kind of roof. You're using what kind of ceiling? Can I mount a speaker? Walking up to the construction guy and going, listen, I need a mount a speaker. It weighs two kilograms and it has hooky majiggies. I don't know how to mount this. Help me. By the way, I bought you a cappuccino. How, do you, how many sugars do you want? Let me tell you, that guy's going to... And you can learn a lot from that. It is helpful to know, but I mean, I have no clue how to mix cement or bricks. But when I'm confused about something, when I'm unsure on a site about how can we mount this, can it support the weight? Is it going to be steel, brick, whatever? That's what I'm saying. Talk to, work with people. And they'll come to you when you start... They might come to you and go, hey, listen, we're putting in this kind of stuff. Is that going to affect your acoustics? Hey, I need to put a light footing right where you're putting your speaker. Can we adjust? Can we work together? It's so important to work together. And you can learn so much of other guys. You know, they're specialists in building. We're specialists in audio. Let's not do his job. He won't do ours. He's not going to tell us where to put a speaker. We're not going to tell us what kind of cement to use. And that's the whole thing. Let him be the expert, but we can talk together, work with them. Perfect. We have a couple more. So the next question is, can you talk about ceiling speakers with back cans or boxes on them and plenum versus non-plenum wire usage? Um, so back cans is an ideal situation. Back cans serves a few purposes. The, I won't get too much into it, but one of the things is that it protects the speaker, stops moisture getting in, dust getting in, rat droppings, 
once at owls. I once found a dead owl in the back of a speaker in a nightclub. But scary and sad. So it protects the speaker, it seals it off. The other very important thing it does, was, uh, one of my things I had there was, you know, shops are getting closer, malls are getting smaller, and we always have a problem with bleed. That is where sound goes into the neighbor's shop. That can stop the sound going up and they force the sound down, which is good in a ceiling speaker. Backhands, so generally we say backhands are always a good advantage. And when we have an open ceiling versus a closed ceiling, it can affect the sound of the speaker. With a backhand, it doesn't matter what's in the ceiling, because the ceiling seal, um, speaker sealed, so it's always going to give us the same sound. So generally we want to backhand, but sometimes budget doesn't allow for it. And the biggest problem with the backhand is we often I find we found so many problems with tiny ceilings where there just isn't the space for a backhand. So I Backhands generally are good, but they don't always fit budgets and they don't always fit spaces. Perfect. The next question is, when using subwoofers in, say, a club or concert venue, do you try to fly the subs in the air or put them on the floor? Um, so that's obviously quite different to small and medium. One thing, I don't want to give an answer, a straightforward answer. We've got to look at the needs. So subs are generally in a live venue reason we generally put them on the floor is people like to feel the bass. Bass isn't just about sounding good. Um, I was friends with, uh, when I was at school, I was made a lot of friends with a few kids who were actually completely deaf. And I was always fascinated by how they go to clubs and they're completely deaf. They feel the music. When you've got a sub on the floor, it vibrates the ground. We can feel it. We feel it there first, especially when you're at a live concert and you're getting into it. It feels great, but it's not always an option. Sometimes we don't have the space. Sometimes it doesn't meet the aesthetic. Sometimes I've done nightclubs that have foam parties. You can imagine what that does to the damage of a speaker. Foam just eats away at it. Um, there's a many reasons why we can't do it. Also, sometimes we put a sub on the floor. We've got a big crowd. The audio is not going to get to the back of the room. So by flying it, it goes over people's heads. So it's really, once again, about looking at it, speaking to the client, can we do it? Can't we do it? What is the best? Flying subs is also more expensive because we need flying hardware, we need safety, we can't have subs falling on people's heads in that in a large sub. So we've got to take a lot into consideration. And sometimes you don't want that vibration. I've done nightclubs where it was on the first floor and on ground floor was a yoga studio. And they last thing only has all night long. So by raising the sub, we don't get the vibration. So once again, we've got to look at our environment, speak to our client, and see what is going to be best. Perfect. The next question is, do you, do you use distributed system design, and is it useful? Um, I'm not too sure if you mean the software, the distribution answer, or type of speakers. That was a bit confusing. Okay. If you're talking, yeah. I was just going to talk Oh, he's yeah. just responded. It said software. Okay, so software. To be honest, I don't. Um, when I started in this industry, the, that stuff didn't exist. May, I'm trying to decide if I, I probably would have used it if I'd started today. But I find I've actually gone back now after years of experience, and I find that experience trumps software. But when I've gone and I've played with it now, I find that it doesn't. It's a, maybe a good starting tool, but it doesn't take a lot into consideration. Once again, if we look at Samantha's coffee shop, it doesn't take into consideration that, the, that we don't want too much audio around the, the bar, you know, where the telephones are. It doesn't take into consideration that it says put the speaker here, but there's an aircon vent there. And I found a much better idea of using the lighting, thinking about, hey, if I put a light here, I'm going to get coverage here. Your brain adjusts a lot better and using your, you know, your eye, looking at the venue, looking at how light would imagine your speakers being like, it actually makes a lot more sense. But it is a good starting tool if you are new to it, if you don't have the experience, start there. Then take that plot maybe. If you're very nervous, if you're very inexperienced, if you're very scared starting out, take that plot, go to site, and then pretend that every dot that it says is a light, a spotlight, and then think, you know, we can then adjust from there. Don't use it as gold. Don't take it as crystal gold, yeah. Perfect, we have one more question. It says, hi, I actually prefer satellite speakers to ceiling speakers. If I am to choose a ceiling speaker, 
What is the appropriate distance for ceiling speakers? Uh, unfortunately, if you're talking about the height of speakers, unfortunately, we usually don't get to choose. We're not building the roof. So the height of the speakers, unfortunately, not, I think. In terms of spacing them apart, we, you know, I love to use my lighting analogy. So let's pretend we've got a small ceiling speaker, a very small one, and it's very high. We can, and we look in the book, the user manual on that speaker says it's got a 50 degree angle. And we pretend it's a light, it's gonna come down like this. And we can see that it's going to end, you can see my hands, this speaker is gonna end about there. So therefore the next speaker we can work out needs to be here because its beam is gonna go there and they'll do a small crossover. We don't want to have a dead spot. So we can kind of gauge that. And if we go, wow, if I do it in that methodology, I'm gonna need 150 speakers, that's crazy. Well then let's rather instead of going for a two inch speaker, let's try a four inch or a six inch, something that's got a wider coverage. So now our light beam comes further and our next speaker can be further. Um, and that also looks, you know, you look at the height of the roof. If you've got a very low roof, oh, you might have to go for more speakers or larger speakers, as you can space it. And I'll tell you, a lot of people say they prefer satellite speakers and there's a lot of advantages. The problem is in a certain situations is, um, you can't tell, but I've actually got a JBL speaker on the wall here. Now, if this was a restaurant and I'm sitting right there. What happens with a wall mount speaker is that table one's got the speaker half a meter from my head and it's annoying as hell. I'm trying to talk to Mallory and this speaker is just in my ear. Table three is quite far from it. With ceiling speaker, we can actually do them. But ceiling speakers are, have many disadvantages. If we do have got a microphone or a lapel, they're terrible because it's gonna change the direction of sound. So for me, I don't like to say that I prefer this type of speaker to that kind of speaker. For me, it's all about looking at our situation, looking at it, talking to our client and choosing what's gonna suit you know, that best. And ceiling speakers are often more budget friendly. Perfect. That looks like all the questions we have. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Jonathan, for your time. This was a great session. I hope everyone has a great afternoon or evening. <laughs> thank you. It's quite dark out here now, actually, where I am. But thank you. I just want to say thanks to Harmon, thanks to Mallory, thanks to Laura, who I know could make it. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, something new for me and I really enjoyed it. Uh, even though I feel like I'm talking to no, it was a bit awkward talking to no one at some stages, but thank you so much. Um, uh, if anyone's any got any more questions, I'm happy, Mallory. If, you wanna, if anyone wants to email me, contact me. I'm a very open person. I don't mind lots of emails, or phone, call, or phone calls are hard because we're all around the world, but sending a WhatsApp or any kind of messenger, I'm very open to it. If anyone wants that, I'm very happy to do that. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Thank one. Thank you. Cheers, Ed. Bye.